Forbes environmentalist Stephen Nowakowski. We've spoken to him before and he's been mapping the impact of these renewables right around the country. He joins me now live from Queensland. Good to talk to you again, Stephen. Yeah, we, showed, uh, we showed last time the animation that you had created of wind farm projects in Queensland. We can show some of that now. This has, shows you all the wind farms that are in place already, also those that are planned to happen in the future. And, and it's really staggering to see this and just how it uh, litters the coastline right up uh, uh, the coast of Queensland. You're now working on a project, I understand, to do the same thing for the whole of Australia. That's going to be pretty, pretty confronting, I think, for most Australians when we see that. Yeah, well, that's right, Chris. Um, it's a huge task because a lot of these developers, um, they propose these projects under the radar and it's very hard to uh, gauge or to map where the turbines are going and the number of turbines per project. However, we have mapped, when I say we, it's actually Rainforest Reserves Australia, which is an organisation I'm involved in, and we've currently mapped so far. We haven't finished yet. We've still got a, f a few more projects to try to map. But we've we've now counted around 17,119 proposed turbines for the country, for the, for the entire country. There's already 4,178 turbines uh, that are existing. Um, in Queensland alone, we've got 3,365 turbines that are proposed, and that will deliver around 22 gigawatt nameplate capacity. But that's that's if all those turbines were running flat strap at 100%, which they don't. They run at, say, 15, 30% uh, yeah. capacity factor. So what that means is that we'd need to double or really triple that figure of turbines, triple that number, uh, to keep the lights on on a summer's night here in Queensland. It's just extraordinary, isn't it? Because we can all see these uh, wind farms around the country uh, and the big impact they're having, and a lot of people are opposed to them, others put up with them. But uh, on those numbers alone, for every wind turbine we see now, another four are being proposed somewhere. And according to the government's figures, you can double that again by the time you get to uh, net zero by, two, uh, by 2050. This brings me to the, to the counterpoint to this, and you're an environmentalist, and this is why you've now switched to the nuclear argument, because instead of all this infrastructure spread across such vast areas of the landscape and our, and our oceans, of course, offshore, nuclear energy produces an intense amount of energy on small sites that don't have to be moved or upgraded for 70, 80 years. It's a hell of a contrast. Yeah, well, that's right. So the, I, I believe nuclear is the silver bullet to climate action. And the reason being is because the plants, the nuclear plants can go into uh, the existing coal-fired power stations, uh, those locations. So as they retire, we can swap them out like for like and use the existing transmission infrastructure. So with renewables, we need to overbuild the entire energy generation network. So we need 10 to 20,000 kilometres of new transmission lines. We need backup, such as a, a network of pumped hydros. We need firming. And, uh, and then we also, on top of that, we need a brand new fleet of gas peaking plants yeah. for when the wind doesn't blow. So, for example, in Victoria, in the last day, um, wind has only generated 0.6 of a percent of its energy uh, generation. So we, so we need to overbuild the entire electricity yep. system. We've got to have a second generation capacity to back up when there, there is no wind. It's spot on. Look, I really appreciate your work, Stephen. It's wonderful. Uh, and we'll be back in touch because I'd love to see this national uh, graphic, this national video re representation of the, the renewables, the major renewables build-out. Thanks for joining us.